Uh, thanks for, for coming. Um, I'm, I'm Rick Sanders uh, with a little law firm I, I started in here in Nashville uh, back in 2011. We do intellectual property uh, law here in town, but we, we, we made a decision not to do, at least not to consciously do, enter, any entertainment or music law. We, uh, I, I started my practice in Silicon Valley, and so I, I was really wanting to do more, more technology clients, and that's when I left my old firm and, and start my own firm. Um, of course, it's Nashville, I still can't, can't help but run into and sometimes represent entertainment clients, but, but that's not who we are and it's not who we uh, um, sort of market ourselves to. Uh, I, was, I was invited uh, a few years ago um, uh, to, to Freaknik, I, I guess it must have been in 2012, and I had a, I had a great time. And there was uh, people had a lot of great questions, and I got about two slides into my presentation, and we just started talking, which is fine. Because I, I know a lot of stuff about IP and software, and I can answer to the extent that the questions, there are answers to the questions, which we don't always have answers. Um, I, I probably know most of them. And uh, to the extent that there aren't answers, I can at least frame what the issues are and what we're looking for and what, 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 what cases are out there that we're, and I, I monitor the cases every day. I get, a, I get an email blast every day, and I'm always looking for uh, particularly copyright uh, questions. So, you know, anytime you guys want to kind of break in and, and ask me questions, that's fine. Uh, I didn't quite know how to pitch this. When I was here last time, people already knew quite a lot about how the law uh, works and doesn't work with software. So that's why I kind of launched right into it. But I do have some introductory stuff just kind of orienting you to where software fits and doesn't fit in, in, in intellectual property law. And then more about copyright, because that's the main thing, although it's not the only thing for software. And, uh, and then we, I then talk about the, the Google Oracle case and what really happened, because there's a lot of sort of misinformation uh, about that. And I, I, it's the one thing I'm asked about the most from folks I meet, technology folks I meet um, out and about and from my own clients. Um, but if, if I feel like, if you feel like I'm just going over stuff, you already know then we can just start skipping skipping through. Um, anybody have any thoughts about that? No? Let's do it. All right. Uh, so let's just orient software, because software doesn't fit in, in the IP scheme very well. Um, you know, you can't blame Congress too much, actually. Um, you know, Congress knew about software and some of the problems that it would create back in uh, 1978, Con uh, Congress actually, this is back when Congress actually worked very carefully and slowly and, and seemed to really want to craft really good laws. And they actually put together a, a, a committee called the CONTU Committee to talk about software and, and really how it should work. And software and the CONTU Committee made recommendations mostly accepted by Congress and, and, and software has been a, a part of copyright law, at least, since 1978. And uh, one of the first cases I know of didn't result, it resulted in a, in a very famous or infamous settlement, but one of the very first cases, actually, was the Gary Went Flying case. If you know the story of Gary Went Flying, Gary Cannell, you know who said Gary Went Flying? A guy named Gates. <laughs> um, well, if you, if you know the story, he, he Canel um, invented the uh, disk operating system. So it was the first operating system that could be used independent of the hardware. It, it, it monitored how the floppy disks worked in your computer. And he, made, he, was, making, he was making bank, because he was the only, he had the copyright on it. Um, and he had this wonderful company um, down in, in Pacific Grove. And one day IBM came knocking and the legend was that he, Gary liked to fly so much that he, he didn't want to meet with the I, IBM, he wanted to go flying instead. This isn't really true, but that's, that's, that, that was the story that kind of went out. And um, the person who actually sent IBM to, to Gary Kimball was, um, was Bill Gates. Because Bill Gates didn't know anything about disc operating systems. 
and and Gary was kind of a friend of his, so he sent him sent IBM to Gary. When IBM went away, kind of not happy with how things went, and it turns out it's because they were because Gary was protecting his legal rights. He was not he wanted he wanted NDAs and things like that. They went back to to um, they went back to uh, Bill Gates, and Bill Gates basically his attitude was, I give you one chance. When they went to him a second time. He what, the problem was. DOS was stuck on 32-bit, and they wanted, they wanted to move on to 64. And they were waiting, and everybody was waiting like two years. It was a good lesson, like don't, even if you have a monopoly, if you wait too long, things happen. And they were like two years behind trying to get a 64-bit version out. And people were hacking 64-bit bit versions just because they wanted to use 64-bit computer chips. And so Gary, uh, Gates found one of these guys, uh, QDOS, and just bought the company. I mean, this is classic Bill Gates. Just bought the company. He, he saw he saw the opportunity, and put out MS DOS, and put Gary out of business. And Gary would go on. It died. I mean, he died a broken man. And he sued, but he sued uh, he sued IBM. He sued, sued everybody. And under the new Copyright Act in '78, um, and it was one of the first first cases to uh, to to treat code as as protectable copyright expression. But uh, he settled, but he got deked. He got deked. IBM decided to put out two versions of their computer, one with MS-DOS, one with his version. But they didn't, he, didn't, he didn't insist on price points. And what IBM did is they sold his version at a higher price point than Microsoft's version. And that killed him. And he'd settled. He'd, he'd thrown away his rights at that point. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Gary, Gary. Gary, it's one of the three found, founding myths of Silicon Valley, Gary, because because it's always because Silicon Valley versus you know versus that that evil empire up north. If, you, if you're from Silicon Valley, Microsoft is sort of this evil, but you know Bill Gates, he gave his he gave his buddy a chance. But Bill Gates, feeling guilty about it, was asked about it later. Felt he he, he said, well, Gary went flying, and that was that that became kind of a, and it was sort of the end of a kind of era, kind of engineer. First era, the idea that software engineers would run the businesses, and you know, basically, is a sign that people like Bill Gates, a software engineer but really a great businessman, was going to deep these guys. And Gary was a smart guy, but just not quite smart enough. So, IP uh, software just doesn't fit in the IP uh, scheme very well. It does not go with hand in glove. It doesn't go like chocolate ice cream and, or chocolate sauce and vanilla. It may be more like the Maginot Line and Belgium, mm -hmm. but really, it's it's like it's like this. Mm -hmm. Number three, the platypus. The platypus. It just doesn't fit. It looks weird, and you can't. You don't. I mean, I mean unless you're a, a, a biologist, you don't know what to call a platypus. Is it a is it a mammal because it's furry and warm blooded, or is it a a, a, a bird because it's got a beak. Is it? Is it? A, or and, and lays eggs for God's sake. You know, we're going to talk about the. You know, it's one of the, actually one of the very few poisonous mammals. Um, weird, weird thing. It just doesn't fit. Now, we, the way we try to make it fit is, is in three, these three categories: patent, copyright, trade secret. I want to talk mostly about copyright. With patent, that's a fairly recent. Actually, the, the idea that software is protected by patents fairly recent, the idea of taking business methods, and, and you say, well, if you run it through a computer, then it's a thing. It becomes a computer that does a thing. I mean, it, you know, that, and so we call it an apparatus, or, or we call it a business method, and the code doesn't matter. We, we assume that er, everybody can code whatever is going to be claimed in the patent. Um, so the code becomes kind of a black box. And now I got to tell you, this is now in retreat. There's been a, a case uh, uh, from the Supreme Court a few years ago called Alice that has uh, questioned a lot of the patent, uh, the software patents, based on on just subject matter. Does it actually do something that's an invention? Um, so th it's in retreat now. But for a while there, last time I was here, I'm talking to you guys. It was it was really the, the way to protect software, but patents a pain though. It, it costs a lot of money. You got to get a patent attorney. It costs tens of thousands of dollars, and you know you got to worry about prior art. And then enforcing patents is expensive. Patent lawsuits are just expensive. You know, 
if you're starting a business, it's a great thing because a lot of investors insist on it. They, they insist even even a, a, a provisional patent application will, is better than nothing. But you know, it's 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 a you know, with with, with a lot of startups, I find, you know, patent is, is a kind of catch twenty uh, two, or or so it's a um, well, it's it's the coffee pot paradox, right? In order to make coffee, you have to be awake, but you are not awake until you make the coffee. Right, you know, you, you need money to, 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 to file for a patent application, but nobody will give you money until you have a patent application. Did I, I just did I just make a par paradox? <laughs> the coffee pot paradox. Uh, copyright, we'll talk about in detail. Trade secret, to the extent you keep your uh, processes and your, your 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 you know, you keep your source code and your. Uh, your, the structure of your your your, of your uh, software secret, then then it's a, it's it's you know you, you can claim trade secret. Trade secret is anything that has economic value that you take reasonable steps to keep secret. But that sometimes that's impossible, right? A lot of software is open source. A lot of times your 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 customers are going to insist on seeing the source code, and that kind of it tends to undercut. Um, uh, the, the, the secrecy investors never ever ever sign NDAs. There's a good reason. Don't even ask. Um, but basically, they're, they they believe that every time every NDA is 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 just a trap. So they, they just won't they just won't sign them. So those are the those are the main areas. But copyright is really where it's closest, which might strike you as a little bit strange, because copyright is there to protect not functions, not ideas. That's all patent. It's there to protect. Um, it's there to protect expression. Now, some expression is very easy, right? We understand a lot of expression. There's uh, novels, and movies, and music, and sculpture, and we, those are how highly expressive. But we have a very low bar. We'll talk about this in more detail. We have a very low bar for what is what is expressive, what is protectively expressive. And the word we use for that is original. Just means it has to be something that has some kind of creative choices that comes out of your own head. Doesn't uh, no, patent has to be novel, right? Patents you have to be the first person to come up with this ever, but software just has to come out of your own head and it has to have some creative choices. So even boring things can be covered by patent if you are uh, by, by copyright. So if you're in your doctor's office and you see one of those pamphlets that says, you know, uh, you know, living with psoriasis and you know how you're going to you know, move on with the rest of your life, and it's this pamphlet that just gives information. It's facts. The facts are not protected. The ideas are not protected, but still there's enough protectable expression that if you were to photocopy this boring pamphlet, you would be committing patent uh, copyright infringement. Nobody would care, but you would, yeah. Are NDAs actually enforceable? Yes, yes they are. Um, but it's just really, really, the trick is getting people to sign them. Um, because you know, again, a lot of the people you most want to sign them are the ones least willing to, and and it's just it's just a huge risk. You you go to a place and you're you're you're, you're pitching to, to investors, and and there's like we're not going to sign NDA. You just have to help, you know. And you got to make a decision: how much under the hood do I show these people to get the money? And that's just a hard business question. That a lawyer can only help you so much. We can prepare the NDA, but. We, we don't have any, any, any black magic, any persuasive black, black magic that other people don't, uh, that other people don't have. So, uh, yeah, these are just some basic concepts. The nice thing about trade secrets that's really interesting is it in some ways protects more than patent, patents, ideas, useful ideas, the ideas you can implement in a useful way. So that's... You know, including games, by the way. I, I, one of the, I once saw a patent for uh, Magic the Gathering because um, it has rules, and I guess having fun is useful. But what well, isn't that the weird thing? Is like game rules aren't patentable. Like, they're, not, or they're hard to copyright. Mode. They're hard to copyright. And we'll talk I about that's that. like one of the things like Monopoly. Yeah. As long as you don't use any of their trademarks. Yeah. You avoid can make avoid. Monopoly games. Yeah, you can. You can probably almost. You can almost certainly photocopy the rules. And we're going to talk about that. So it's merger. There's, because the rules are an idea. And yes, there's an expression, right, of the rules. But there's only one really good way to express the rules, right? Or just a few, right? And so we, we say, well, if, the problem is if we give copyright protection to those 
that expression, and that's the best way to express it, then we've essentially given copyright protection to something that's really for patent. That's an idea. And we don't like to do that, because copyrights last, well, basically forever. I mean, life of the author plus, I don't know, what, what are we up to, 70, 80, 90 years? 70 years. 70 author, years. Any, author's, li author's life plus 70 years is what? Uh, yeah, I, I, I lose track because I know I'll be dead by the time. Um, and, and, any, and anything that's, that's expiring now, it was, was made under the old 1909 Act, which has completely different rules. You, you had another question. But, uh, what's the main protection on trade secrets? The license and green the agreement that you're not allowed to, to reverse engineer something? Um, well, that becomes a contract. So you can use contract to get, get yourself lots of goodies that the law otherwise would not protect. So you can have in a license agreement, thou shalt not reverse engineer because we believe, we're not sure, but we believe that reverse engineering is fair use. Um, but you might find, you might agree to a license that says thou shalt not do this. But then that's just a contract, breach of contract, which may not have any real damages. And it may not lead to an injunction. It's not quite as good as, as copyright, patent, trade right, secret, secret protection. Trade secret is uh, right now still protected, is still covered under state law, so it changes from state to state. Um, and one thing is, you, you, if people, you do disclose information, one thing you got to do is make sure that they promise to keep it secret. So that's through one. So, 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 so trade secret, may, the enforcement on that would maybe be if you can prove that, some, that somebody with knowledge of it released it, but, but if somebody work, if somebody figures out the details without yeah. learning from an insider, then, mm -hmm. then it would not be. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you, yeah. It, uh, but both copyright and trade secret allow for independent creation. Um, and the key is 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 keeping it, taking reasonable steps to keep it secret. In a factory, it's easy, right? You don't let people in to see your secret processes. Software, it's hard because it's harder trying to keep this stuff. You can look at it from the outside. Yeah. You duplicate the same yep. thing with your own techniques. That's okay. If I can buy your product, and and I can figure out, I, at that point, anything that I can reverse engineer is mine. It's mine too, I should say. I, mean, I, I, can, I can get at. Um, sometimes it's harder than you might think. Um, it took forever, for example, uh, uh, sticky notes. 3M patented some things, but didn't patent everything. They decided that some things in their sticky notes, they, they thought their competition would not be able to reverse engineer. Or at least the, the, the thought was it would take them longer than the life of a patent to reverse engineer. And I think they were more or less right. I, I, I'm not sure. And to this day, I still think, I still think the 3M ones are a little better than, than the generic ones. Um, anyway, it, always, it reminds me of the, of the Simpsons episode with the flaming mo. Right? <laughs> they couldn't figure out the one secret, the one secret ingredient. You couldn't reverse engineer the one secret ingredient. Oh, yep. Uh, but trade secrets are cool because they can protect things that you can't protect with patent, like facts, like your customer data. Um, very hard to protect facts. Europe, Europe, Europe will let you protect facts, but your database of facts, really hard to protect. You, it's trade secret is, your, is, your, is your, really your only bet. And there's some stuff, you know, anti-circumvention stuff, but. So what are ways that I can come upon a trade secret, but it still be legally protected? Oh God, that's a really good question. So I've got to, like, is I've got there a legal protection? That, that's the, the virtue of me having it makes it no longer a secret. Yeah, uh, you know, I am actually in a. I have a case where we are <coughs> probing the borders of that um, because yes, I've got a client who uh, uh, was invited by a third party that was demolishing the factory, and he came in and he looked at stuff, and now they're saying, well, because just receiving. The trade secret can be is a misappropriation, but we're like, well, wait a minute, you let us into the freaking building. It's not it's not a trade secret anymore, and and you know, we're yeah, I'm not I'm not <laughs> sure. Obviously, with a product that's out in the public, that's easy stuff that you can see from the road, sure, but probably not like sending a drone over to spy. That's probably not cool. But yeah, you know, what if you're what if you're like on tour and you're not split, there's certain certain restricted areas, but you don't realize what they are and you go into one that maybe you shouldn't and you find out something? Uh, I don't know. That's actually maybe the what my what my current case is going to turn. It's the reason why I'm so busy these days. <laughs> All right. So we I think we've gone over over this. 
So I want to I want to put software because when you're coding, I want to tell, I want to give you a sense of then what the structure is. And we we got like what an hour hour and a half. So I want to make sure I get it's to the will be Google what? It's an hour. We got an hour. Okay. All right. So very quickly. I want to give you a sense of the structure that you're, you're putting into this. It just shows how difficult it is to, to shoehorn copyright into, uh, or, or software into copyright. Um, because with, with, now, there's easy, right? There's, there's easy infringement, there's difficult infringement. And easy infringement is, you know, if I, if, I, if I pirate a copy of some popular software program, right? I don't know if anybody's ever been on the wrong end of a BSA or SIIA audit. I represent a lot of clients who, who are, they're no fun. Right, that's, that we might call that easy infringement because you have a, 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 a bit for bit copy of the, of the software. Obviously, that's, that's a copy. But what about when you have access to somebody's source code and, and you, 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 are, you use it to help you create your own software? This comes up much less frequently. In the old days, what we used to do, I don't know if they still do, but I remember this is something I used to do when I was in a, a, a young associate in Silicon Valley. We used to have, we used to, a company would actually buy software legally, decompile it in one room, and the lawyer, lawyer would then be standing between these two rooms, and they decompile it in one room, and then they would hand it to the lawyer. The, the sort of the, they, they would break down the computer program into its structure and its functionalities, and then they would handed the computer to, to, to the lawyer, and the lawyer then hand it to programmers, and, and, and they were instructed to take the, that, this information and, and write their own code. And the idea is that would not infringe copyright, because not only do things have to be the same, but they also have to, you have to copy. You actually have to have access to the underlying work, and by breaking it down into ideas, and then turning it back into expression, that's okay. This was called a clean room. I don't know if they do, they don't do as much as they do, because you, you, that, that was like 2,000 and stuff. You know, you, you can really sell soft, you know, enterprise level software for $100,000. One click buy, that was, mine. That was yeah. a Phoenix BIOS. Yes, I mean, there were lots of examples of, of, of that, but that was how they used to do it. I don't know if they, I don't know if they still do it. What about rewriting software that you wrote for somebody? Oh, that's, that happens a lot. <laughs> um, and you gave away the software, apparently, right? I mean, you gave away the, the copyright, right? Sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's... Um, and then I was always very careful about how I wrote the contract. I said, this copy of the software is yours, but any ideas and things that they use, and I may also create utilities and tools within the yeah. context but of... Like, not reusing the code. Like, you know, you, I write it yeah. on your laptop, don't take it with me. Yeah. Um, but rewrite it myself, because... Re rewrite it yourself. And, and, it's, and the problem there is, you know, the, the way you, you structure your, your, your agreement will, will, will save you a lot of trouble. But if you don't, you got you got a problem because if you end up writing what is substantially similar, you know, we'll talk about that why this is a hard concept in software. But if you end up writing something substantially similar, you had access to it, right? Because you remembered the idea is you probably remembered how you did it, and and so this 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 is a problem that comes up. I've, I've never seen a reported case on this, but it's a problem that comes up. And the fact is, you can uh, you, you you can infringe a work that you yourself created if you gave away the copyright. The, there's a famous example of this from the, like 1910 of a photographer who took a picture, sold the picture and the copyright, and then he recreated the photograph and was successfully sued for a copyright infringement of his own photograph. Um, and it's, it's a it's a it's a risk. In software, it's a little, I, you know, my experience with software engineers is they don't feel as strongly as they do as like songwriters and whatnot, but it's a risk of giving away your copyright. Is you've given away a lot more than just, just you know, the right to reproduce. Um, and so people often don't realize the, the full, the consequences of giving away a copyright. Having said that, songwriters give away their copyrights all the time. It's bizarre. And you lose a lot of control. So let's take the example of, of a novel, which is highly expressive. So what I want to talk about is the sort of layers of abstraction that may or may not be copied. This is where it's really important for software. 
So um, my, my daughters are, my, my, my older daughter has already gone through this, my younger daughter is now in the middle of book two. And nobody owns the idea of a school for wizards. Anybody recognize this is a, one of the great these, uh, wood carvings from the original, the original um, edition of Wizard of Earthsea? Okay. Well, Wizard of Earthsea was Ursula Gwynn's school of wizards. It was a school of rogue in 1968. And obviously she has no claim against J.K. Rowling for just a school of wizards. Okay. But I would not get too close to Hogwarts. Hogwarts has got enough stuff, enough creative thought behind it. Even if you can't, even if, even beyond the description in the words in the novel, we know a lot about Hogwarts now. And if you start getting too close to Hogwarts, then J.K. Rowling can and will go after you. So, J so you can think of Hogwarts as a kind of a character. You might have heard recently the Batmobile is, is, is protectable expression. This is the same kind of thing. Enough, en and we have enough description, we have enough, and, and of course this is easier, fantasy novels are easier because every fact in a fantasy novel is actually protect, isn't really a fact, it's, it's protectable creation. So don't get close to this. Um, having, having, having said that, right, you can create a school of wizards that has, say, four houses. Right? You can do that because that's how the that's how every British public school is is operates. Every year it's broken into four. It's a thing they don't do. She didn't make that up. So that's in the public domain, right? So you can get pretty close, but don't get too close. How close? I don't know. That's the, the inflection point between something that's a pure idea, just a school of wizards or a school of wizards maybe with four houses. And then you start adding, you start, it's like a Christmas tree, you start adding more and more decoration, and pretty soon you, you passed over from abstract expression to a less abstract, protectable structure. Even if I've never read or heard or seen Harry Potter? Uh, no. Independent creation is always a defense. However, if you make something that sounds a lot like Hogwarts, have a real strong claim of how you've never heard of Hogwarts. Then, then okay, it's, you it's a change of burden of proof. I would have, or Rowling would have a burden of proof to show that it's substantially similar. At that point, it becomes a defense on your, your burden to prove that you had never heard of it. And there is such a thing as striking similarity, which is that kind of easy, like, word for word, where it's like, there's no way you could have come up with this unless you had access. And you probably end up with gray areas where person A has not read person mm -hmm. but they hurt but they heard enough details about it through an intermediary. Yeah. yeah, the legal concept there is, is is called access. And it can be it can be difficult. Um, particularly when it goes through a, there's a chain of access. Um, just sending your song to Mary J. Blige's um, record label does not did, did not create access between you and Mary J. Blige. There's case law on that. So you have to it has to be a little has to be a more more of a connection than that. Um, this is an example of of something that's under copyright, but a lot of it's not really under copyright. I mean a lot of it's probably not protectable. This is a uh, the the NEC Aspire multi button telephone feature handbook. I picked this because this is the phone, the kind of uh, uh, phone I got in the office. And now you look at this and you say, well, let's just take a look at some things that are not, that are, that are probably not copyrightable. How about the, the picture? The, the, now somebody has designed, somebody didn't just take a photograph of the, of the phone, but somebody just, just drew a diagram, an accurate diagram of the phone. So there isn't a lot of creative choice there because whoever did it, was trying to be accurate. The fact that you work hard on it, by the way, is irrelevant. There's a really important case called Meshworks where um, some advertising, uh, uh, an advertising agency hired some um, 3D render modelers to, to model a Toyota car, and they did a great job. And in fact, not only did they have to scan the car, 
but because the computer doesn't quite render, there's certain optical illusions that are introduced by a straight scan into, in, in, when re rendered into 3D, a human being had to go in there and make little tweaks. Even so, even so, even with all that hard work and the, and the equipment and a human being involved, making tweaks to make it look like more like the, the real Toyota car, court held no copyrightable pr protection because they, all they had done is replicated something in nature. So, same idea here. Facts, things in nature uh, are not. Yeah, oh, so you, you just answered. Yeah. So, facts. So, this is a fact. All right. So, let's, um, um, let's take another couple of examples. Uh, here, I don't know, the illustration, I guess, is kind of protectable. Um, there's a guy waving. This is awesome. <laughs> Um, this is, I think, a little more protectable. <laughs> I'm pretending that this is an exciting story. You're reading through this and it's an exciting story. And, and this is like, okay, that's pretty protectable and, and actually mildly disturbing. Um, here's an example, a page I just wanted to put up and, and wonder if any of this is protectable. This is somebody trying to explain to you how the park feature works. You know, if you have one of the old style phone systems, you probably use park a lot. I, I don't know park very well. Doesn't the amount of it matter? Like the whole manual itself could be copyrightable, but like this one individual section in its own right might not be? Well, yes. So we can say, I mean, this actually becomes a question of infringement because what we're looking for with infringement is quantity and quality. Um, stuff that's very important and highly, highly creative, you need less of it to, you need to copy less of it to infringe, but stuff that's boring, less expressive, you might have to copy a lot more of it, it's not very central. But also we do some filtering, we're not quite sure how, but we will filter out stuff that's not copyrightable. And of course the way, and I'll get to this, the way this is structured might be copyrightable, but all the information there in there, in there might not be. This is important for the Oracle case. I'm going to get to that. You had a question. Uh, I know that I know that in the case of, like, say, a book of poetry, in, where the individual poems can be public domain, but the collection mm -hmm. can be copyrighted. That's exactly right. Because the idea is that there's there's choice and arrangement is a creative choice. But the only thing that's copyrightable then is the way it's ordered. And you see already, we copyright, we, we give copyright protection to not just the sort of ground level expression, the words, the bits, the points of color in a painting or a pixel in a, in a, in a computer rendered design, but also to, to larger structures. And just the idea though is at some point you start abstracting up and up, and we'll talk about this, you get to an inflection point where you, you leave the atmosphere or you, you leave, you go into orbit and you're no longer um, under, under uh, under copyright protection. But here, I, I, would, I would wonder, if you just photocopied just this page, I would wonder if this is copyright infringement. I don't know if there's any copyright, copyright protection here because there's probably only, this is probably one of the very few concise ways, we're trying to create a concise, easy to understand way to explain the park feature. And the park feature itself has certain criteria that are just unchangeable. Not, I didn't create those. They're just part of the phone. So, I might think this is, this is subject to something called the merger doctrine, which I, I've already alluded to, which is where the idea of the park feature and the expression, because there's only one good way, or a few good ways, to express this park feature. Again, you know, the criteria here are, we gotta describe the park feature accurately, fully, concisely. We don't wanna go on for pages and pages, and in a way that's easy to understand. Given those criteria, which are not copyrightable criteria, um, I wonder if, if this merges with the idea. Would you any... would you be able to argue like their own vocabulary? Like I've never I've worked in telephony before. Typically, we call them you know parking lots or something else other than system orbits. Like the fact that they came up with their own uh, jargon. Does I, that I, matter? I think not, and I'll tell you why. That's a good point. I'll tell you why because it's not enough. Uh -huh. To me, that's, that's, that's just two words isn't quite enough creativity. Right. Isn't quite enough. Now I can imagine some ways. I mean, you can come up with some creative, interesting ways. You know, I could create a, 
um, in, instead of this, I could tell a story of a romance between two people in the office and somehow the park feature plays a, a key role and it explains to you how the, how the park feature works. That would be very creative. Uh, but I would still not have copyright to how the park feature works. But I think this, you know, it's, 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 it's a very stripped down, boring way of doing it. Um, these, I don't. I didn't. That's 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 something I didn't know about. But I don't think that's. I think that it's not insane. And, yeah. it, and you're right. It is only two words mentioned just, twice. Just two two words. But and they use. And we don't normally give copyright protection to just tiny things. Although, so to step back a second, in terms of access, can you force access on somebody? Um. Yeah. Yeah. You can. If I stuck it in, in your face. Yeah. Because then. Yeah. Uh, boy, I, I, I wonder if, there, if that would create a defense of some sort, some kind of. But I tell you, it's in per terms of pure infringement, yeah, I, I think I don't. I don't think that would undercut the infringement case. It might create but some kind of defense, like some kind of estoppel, some kind of weird equitable defense, which is equi equitable. just means fair, which is where a judge says, I, I, I see, I see you did it, but I, this is unfair. But the burden is still be on on you. So this is, the, so this is to me, is a possible example of merger. It's rules of games, of lotteries, things like that are another example of merger. But you get a lot of this in software, too. This is why I'm, I'm talking about it outside the context of software. If there's only one good way to code one function, then merger is going to apply. You're probably not going to get copyright uh, in that. Um, so yeah, I talked about levels of abstraction, this idea that you at some point around, somewhere between ideas and themes, et cetera, and the story, this is in, 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 in ex using the example of, say, a Harry Potter novel, somewhere in there is the inflection point. We don't know quite where. Learned Hand, who's probably the best, greatest copyright judge of all time, that's his real actual name, Learned Hand. Um, he said, yeah, you just don't know. And, and in the end, it's up to the jury. So it's up to the it's up to the jury. It, it seems like a kind of nitpicky question, but this is something we see a lot with like malware. People will obfuscate it in a way, but they took an original piece of code, made it something completely different. The same code doesn't exist, but the original code was a starting point. Um, would that be infringement? It's a completely different implementation, but automatically generated off of your initial one. Okay. Now, if I were to compare the malware code to the original code. Would I find similarities? Oh, we can we can ignore the whole malware concept. Okay. I just brought it up because what will happen is someone will run their their own code through this. But mm -hmm. let's say I ran your game through it or whatever. Yeah. And there's none of your original code left. Uh, I've programmatically changed it all, so it yeah. works the same, but it's just different code. I would say it's just a compiler. It's the same code. If you just obvious, if you me mechanically obfuscate, it's the same same original. It, can you reverse data. it? Yeah. Exactly. You could make it de obfuscated. Yeah. Because at that point, it becomes the equivalent of a translation. And that's considered an adaptation, and a translation of Harry Potter is as much an infringement of Harry Potter as the original. So if it can be reversed, um, or some kind of some kind of encryption, and of course also you know your source code is protected, and so would be any compiled version of that. However, bear in mind that when you make copies, often you have to make copies of software in order to use it. You have to make, make copies of, of software in order to reverse engineer it. We have cases where 50, they had to make 50 copies recursively in order to reverse engineer a game. And at least the Ninth Circuit tells us it's fair use. Now that, now fair use is a defense. So it's still infringement, but fair use because we, we, we like competition. Now here we have the table of contents of, of that, that, that phone uh, guide. And we see that there's a structure to, the, to this to this um, to this phone guide, and that structure might be protectable. That is the organization of information. At least that first part until we get to about page nine, right? That might be protectable at that level, that level of abstraction. Just it doesn't matter what information I put in there. If I follow, I can use my own words, but if I follow that precise organization, I might be infringing. Right? And again, we, we, we might have a merger issue, but I might be printing. But then look at the features. That's just like the phone book, though. It's just an alphabetic order. No creativity, right? Yeah, it would be just a phone book, and we actually have Supreme Court case law on, on phone books. Again, the fact that you worked hard, sweat of the brow, doesn't matter. 
So I could photocopy your phone book and make it my own because it's fact. Yep. It's all facts. It's all facts. Mm -hmm. Unless there's some weird creative way to organize it. And right. You probably might, couldn't photocopy the yellow pages, right? You could. Yeah, the yellow pages are harder because you, you've got you've got. I don't know. <laughs> The, the, the problem with the yellow pages is you have like some ads. you have some some categories that might be creative, and of course you have some images. The white pages or a database of people's just where they live, just facts. Now, if you have to break into the database, we have different issues, but <laughs> but it's not copyright. Is that always the the opinion of like databases? Because like databases often have you know how the I, the, I, the schema or whatever is an I, is yeah, creative. Yeah, that's or? that's a really good point. Um, Yes, if I grab, I, I certainly some databases have a schema that, again, it, it, it's going to be a question, can we separate the functionality from the schema? And are there more than, are there multiple ways to do it? And so we run into the same merger problem. But the schema is a structure that is not a fact. The question is, is it, is it purely functional? It's, it's carrying out a function, that's for sure. I can't imagine why else right. you'd have a schema. It's, maybe it's a random schema, and it's, it's probably not fulfilling its primary function. <laughs> but is there, are there more than one way to do it? And, and that would be a difficult question. But yeah, if you steal the, you know, this is, I mean, sucking the data out of a database is one thing, but it's a, more, it's a little riskier to actually just make a copy of the whole database, schema and, and, and all. Also, with some databases, you would have like uh, functionality built into the database. That, right. Like if you delete procedures one thing, it, yeah, yeah, procedures. So that procedures are probably code, and therefore, I would think copyrightable. Could be. Again, we're gonna have, we're gonna run into some some, yeah. some merger issues. Maybe able to organize the data and the tables and things in a way that you might have done before and able to yeah. solve the problem. And you'd be surprised how low a bar that can be. And the, 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 the cases that are actually the most interesting, because we don't have that much software cases, are cases involving part numbers. It used to be you get a catalog of part numbers. And we had three cases in a row, and they kind of explained to you how they work. One, the part numbers were random, no copyright. It was arbitrary, no creative choice. The other one is they were highly structured. You could tell just by looking at the part number everything you need to know about the part, like where, where, what, what department it came from and what function it did. It, no copyrightability because the numbers were being determined by function, functional considerations. Finally, we got one involving dental codes. And somehow, I guess, finally some, some lawyer figured out some sweet spot where they were, they, they, they were functional but not too functional. I, I wish I could tell you exactly what they did that was so wonderful, but we know that, that there, if, if it's too functional, no, no protection. If it's random, no protection. If it's sort of in between, Able protection. So we talked about mergers, is why we, we avoid overprotecting ideas. Ideas to be protected by patent. Patents only last 20 years. Copyrights last for a freaking ever. So, I mean, or, you know, again, I know we're up to life plus 70, but Steamboat Willie is going to come up, you know, into the public domain pretty soon, and we'll, we'll, that'll probably get extended. I have strong feelings uh, about this. Yeah. That, that matter. When was the last uh, IP that entered the uh, public domain? Um, under previous ones, things we, we have some lately, things under the 1909 Act that still come in. Um, they were given a, a, an extended lease on life, but they are going into the public domain. There's a website you can go to. I wish I knew what it was. That every year tells you what would have gone into the public domain, but right. isn't. I, I have strong feelings about this because I, I like copyright. I, 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 I ascribe to, to its primary goal, which is, to, is, which is to encourage creativity. But those creative people who take from the public domain, Disney's an example of this, they, they have to give back. And the way they give back is that their copyrights expire and go to the public domain so that everybody can use them. And go through every single Disney film there's a few. There's a few that are original, but most of them come out of the public domain. Most notably, they waited to make Pinocchio. They actually, they had plans to make it, and somebody realized that they waited two years, they wouldn't have to get a license. So 1908? Um, yes, was, yeah, that's, that's the old Copyright Act, 1909 Act. So something created then is in the public domain. Uh, yeah, the magic number, I think, is 1928. If, right. if it was made before 1928, 
this, and we know about this, we had a really interesting case involving Sherlock Holmes. And we discovered that most of Sherlock Holmes is in the public domain, and, but it, it turns out there were some uh, later versions of, of, some later stories of Sherlock Holmes that were written after 28. And to the extent that they introduced anything new about Sherlock Holmes, those are still under copyright, but almost everything else you know about Sherlock Holmes is in the public domain. Somebody had to sue. And it turns out the state of, of Conan Doyle would, would ver was very aggressive. We have the also same thing with, with Happy Birthday, which we think is mostly in the public domain. It's not as simple as that. I thought recently they decided that, the, that they didn't have the copyright on the lyrics that uh, it, whoever was claiming that. It's pretty complicated. We, we, yeah, we, we basically what we, what we do, what we know is we don't know who owns the copyright. Right. That's what I thought. <laughs> we don't, right. And that some of it is in the public domain. It's one thing to be in the public domain, it's another thing for people not to know who owns the right. copyright. Well, I know, there's, I know, I know that every time Steamboat Willie is yeah. about to go out of copyright, yeah. Disney lobbies to have yeah. the extended. Disney's very, Disney's very powerful. So, we, But we don't, anyway, with merger, the idea of merger is we, we, we don't use copyright to give patent like protection. We already discussed that. So when we look at software, applying these concepts to software, oh, I got you to Oracle. Um, there, are, there are limits on, on the protectability in your software, at least again, if it's not a kind of you know, slavish copy, a, a bit for bit copy, over abstraction, right? The ideas are not, right? The functionality is not protected. Um, we have to look out for merger. And this is the funny thing about, the soft, about, about copyright law is you're punished for being good. The merger, the merger doctrine will punish you for being good because if you come up with the most elegant way to solve a problem, the law doesn't want to, doesn't want to give you an exclusive life of the author plus so many years right to that most elegant way to solve the problem. And that, that will, so you, you will lose your copyright to that part owing to merger. So it's, it's funny, it's, I mean, you get more protection if you do a bad job, but. There's also something I, I call the coder's toolbox. I think every creator has a kind of toolbox of stuff that's in common to everybody in that, in that field. Uh, it, it's something we call it Sons of Fair, which comes from, from play, playwrights, which, are, which are the idea is that there are certain stock characters, like the boastful soldier, the young lovers, these sort of people. These characters are in common to everybody. They may, they may not be too abstract for, for protection, but they're, they're in the toolbox. The same thing with the coder's toolbox. I basically think of anybody who, any, any, any technique that you're learning today, you're coming out of a software school today, is probably in that toolbox, and nobody has the exclusive right to it. Interoperability, this is actually a concept of fair, fair use, but it's, it's an important one. If you, have to, if you have to borrow code in order to make your program work with an operating system, Courts will hold that that's a fair use, and that will, you will not have copyright in that. And then, of course, there's the whole Pandora's box of open source, and and, and that's like a whole other conversation. So to get very quickly now into Oracle v Google, because it's it's important, to, particularly this idea of abstraction, because you'll be surprised what it was that Oracle ended up winning on. First of all, I want to make clear that Oracle mostly lost the case. It tends to get lost in the in the translation. So you guys know about Java came out in '95. The idea was that it was it was a it was a platform independent, um, originally meant for devices, but it turns out it worked really well uh, with browsers. And um, it, it has lots of di different bits, but generally, right, there's the virtual machine, which is what allows it to sort of be cross-platform. There's the language itself. And then there's the API library because right your computer can't use its own library when it's running Java. It needs it needs Java's own library in order to to, to work. And um, until 2007, it, every, all of this Sun licensed this uh, for free. And then at some point, they licensed everything but the API library uh, under the GNU uh, general license. Which I have strong opinions about the GNU general license, but. I, I liked open source, but it's a, it's a, it's a, the change in my license is like, one day it's going to blow up. Uh, and just legally it's going to blow up. But problem, and, and, and Sun, Sun never, I mean the thing is Sun never really tried to make a lot of money off of Java directly. 
problem, Oracle took them over. The big difference between Scott McNeely and um, Larry Elson. I, I grew up there. There was a big difference between two guys. Um, and uh, Oracle is a little more litigious. And Larry protects his turf. Okay, you probably know about the APIs. They're, they're organized in a library. There's these you know, they're, they're, they're methods. Then there's patent. The methods are, are you know, like methods, methods are, are collected together into packages and the packages into a um, in, into the library. Each method has a, a declaration, an implementation declaration, tells the, tells the Java virtual machine where to go, the name, the, 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 the path that will take the virtual machine to the right method. And then the method will, the, and then the implementation is the, is the little bit of code that um, actually does what the API is supposed to do. Google. Uh, felt like it was behind in in the uh, in the uh, mobile operating system market, and the quickest way to where it wanted to go was through Java. Uh, Oracle um, was wanting more than Google was willing to pay. Google decided that they could actually they didn't need Oracle, and with, and 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 what they did is they did their own version of the clean room. They actually hired people. I mean, because it was pretty obvious what each API did, right? So it's pretty easy just to tell a bunch of coders, this is what we need. Please code the same methods. What's really interesting is that 99, about 94% of the code is identical. So these guys had no access, right? And I can tell you, Google did it right. They had a lot of money, so they, they, they hired people and they did it right. So they had no access, but 94% 94 of the code was the same, which tells you something. It tells you a lot of that code wasn't copyrightable in the first place. Because two independent people came up with the exact same way to implement the same thing. That means, to me, that expression is merged. You all came up with the one really good way to implement it. Anyway, not copying, right? But the, the problem was, they still had to use the API library. Right? They had to use the structure of the API library. So, they, so all the methods, all the code, the word-for-word the, 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 the word -word code was, was, could be the same, but no copying. They still had to use the API li the library the way it was structured. Why? Because if they used their own structure, people programming in Java wouldn't know where to find things. And it turns out, I didn't know this at the time, but the API, the, the Java API library is pretty extensive. And unless you kind of no, unless you're familiar with it, you, it's, it's like finding a needle in a haystack and the organization helps everybody who's familiar with it find stuff quickly and easily. And Google argued at, at the lower court that, that um, they argued in favor of merger. They said the organization of the APIs was merged because everybody knows them. But if we did it any other way, it wouldn't work. Okay, and, and the court bought that. Now I want to point out a few things. This was not terribly well briefed at the trial court because it was mostly a patent case. It's mostly a patent case and the patent part went to jury and the jury found for Google, which is a big victory. If you're a lawyer, that's your top victory. and you can't do better than a jury, jury defense verdict. And almost all the money involved in the case went to the patent side. The copyright side was not worth very much. And at this point, I gotta think, if Google wants to set up its own organization, they probably can. At this point, back then, right, when they're just starting, the, a new organization might have been might have killed Android, right? If, if people could not easily program for Android. It, Android may never gotten off the ground. But at this point, I gotta think Google now has enough leverage they could probably come up with their own organization. But put that aside. For whatever reason, Oracle does not they do not appeal the, the patent side. They only appeal the, the copyright side. In part because jury verdicts are hard to reverse. Now again, I, I, I've mentioned we don't know. We have very few cases. We have very few cases about this kind of copying when it's not verbatim. Okay, and I already mentioned they didn't copy. Here's an example. This is the, this one of the simplest. This is the one that was used all over and discussed over and over again in the case in the, in the cases. This is the simplest method. You can see the implementation is, um, I think, the first 
the declaration is the first two, first three lines, and I think the implementation is the last two lines. Right, again, the first, first two lines just tells you where to find it and how it's going to be used, the syntax, and the other two just tells you how it's gonna work, and it's, of course, the simplest one there is, right? You put in two numbers, you say max, you put in two numbers, you get, and it returns the larger of the two. So there it is. Right, that's that's how that's how it works. On appeal, we were all very surprised. I was surprised. If you if you read my blog, you, you saw I, I had to I, I I was very excited by the lower court decision because I thought it made sense to me. And the federal circuit, because it was a it was mostly a patent case, so it went to the federal circuit instead of the ninth circuit. Um, told us we were all wrong. We were looking through the wrong end of the telescope. Because we were looking at it based on how things are now, not how things were in 1995. And they said back in 1995, it wasn't an issue about people needing to use Java or, or be familiar with the Java library. That comes later. 95, whoever put that, whoever organized the Java library, had to make creative choices. And so merger takes place based, based on that, what happened then, not what happens later when, when Android comes along and, and Google wants to piggyback on Android. And this, I, I, I gotta tell you, Federal Circuit's right, I, I'm chagrined. I can't tell you how chagrined I am, because I was wrong, but Federal Circuit was right. We were looking at it at the wrong time. Uh, here's an example of the organization that they were talking about. I got this from the um, from Oracle's brief. So this is what we're talking about. And the idea is that somewhere in there, it's so extensive, it's so extensive, somewhere in there, there's got to be some creative, creative choices that are not completely driven by functionality. Right? If it's driven entirely by functionality, maybe. You might wonder, though, what about that? What about the fact that whoever put this together must have been wondering to themselves, how can I put together a library that is easy to use, that is intuitive, that is organized in a way that people will expect, right? Those are not copyrightable features. Unfortunately, Google didn't argue that at trial. And you can try and imagine, how would you argue that? You would need experts to, you have to go back to 1995 and, and, and you'd have to show to the jury, or, or actually in this case, the judge. Yeah, yeah sorry I'm running a little late. Um, uh, you have to go, I mean, it would have been a, a monster of, a, of an argument to make, and, and Google just went with a simpler argument, which worked for a while. But th there is an argument to be made that as big and complex as this is, this was entirely driven by functional concerns, ease of use, intuitiveness. You, you could even maybe get some um, experts to say, back in 95, we all had basic understandings of how libraries should be organized, and this is just organized in the way anybody would have done it. And if, if they could have made that argument, then they would have succeeded in making a merger argument. But they didn't. We don't know. We'll never know. Because they just they, they decided not to make that argument trial. They thought they had a better argument. Now, what about interoperability? That has been remanded. The question now is, Java having become so common, that library being so common, do we now have a, does everybody now have a fair use to use that organization so that their products can be interoperable with Java? And that has been remanded and we're still waiting for that, for that truck, for the trial uh, court to come back with a decision. Like, I don't think it's been argued yet. I think it'll be argued in December or January. So we're waiting on that. So the interoperability argument is still up in the air. And again, this is the thing I talked about just a minute ago. Um, so the takeaways are, in some ways, as big and epic a case, and it's the case that everybody always wants to talk to me about. Right? Whenever a software engineer wants to talk to me about anything legal, which is not that often, but when they do, this is what they want to talk about. And they're particularly worried about the idea of APIs. APIs are out there. I use APIs all the time, but I have to worry. I think the answer is no, right? Because this is in some ways a very unusual situation. We had a particularly unusually old, I mean the fact that it was, it was designed in 95 is part of the problem. It's just 
old. Trying to get evidence from back to 95 would have been hard. Highly complex, and it had to do with the structure of APIs. Not only that, it has to do with a particular kind of API. These are, these are APIs that, these aren't the kind, you know, what people would get nervous about is they say, well, I want to use APIs that help me use Google Maps with my, with my mobile app or something like that. This is not the kind of API, right? This is a different kind of API. This is like a library of APIs that you might find on, on any, in any operating system. Um, so I'm not, I'm not too, too worried that, that this, this has to do with APIs generally. I think it has to do with a very unusual set of uh, a library, a, a organization of, of, of APIs. Um, and that we don't have to worry about this generally. But, you know, this does show that, the, you know, that, that copyright protects more than a lot of people think it does. So it protects more than just the, 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 the base level of expression, not just the words or the bits, um, not just the, the pixels, not just the dots of paint, but it can protect the story, right? What, what's, what's the equivalent of the story uh, in your you know, software? It also raises another issue. Is copyright patent tracing, all these things, but is this the right way to protect software? When I talk to software engineers, this is not intuitive to them. Songwriters, painters, novelists, you know, they get, they, they, they see how copyright applies to their work. Software engineers, this doesn't quite make sense to them. And I, and I think that's a, that's, an, that's, a, that's a sign to me that this isn't a good fit. And patents aren't a good fit either. I think, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, and, and trolling is one reason, but there's a lot of other reasons that patent isn't quite the right way. Trade secret has built-in limitations, right? Secrecy, right? So, so it means, you know, you get the protection, but you can't keep a secret. Is, should there not be a, a, a way of protecting software that is, that's specific to software, specific to the unique way that software straddles this realm between Expression and functionality. It's so not a patent, not a not, not copyright, but something that's that that that, and also something that makes sense to the way software engineers and software businesses normally operate. Because I, I I would say that any law should be made thinking in terms of how people already operate. So that the idea is that you you should be able to intuitively. Right? You should always be able to intuitively comply with the laws. Like, like tell people, with, with respect to most laws, people say, how do I obey the laws? And with most laws, you just play nice, and, and you'll, you'll be fine. But copyright's not one of those areas. Antitrust is another one. So, I mean, it's a, well, it, it, if you have to stop and think in order to do your job, or call a lawyer in order to do your job, then perhaps the law is perhaps not a good fit. Um, Unfortunately, Congress can barely even get its head around copyright, you know, copyright reform, let alone how this should affect soft software. Big software publishers kind of like things the way they are, so it's going to be hard to get Microsoft on board, for example, to some any, any kind of this reform. Any thoughts on that? I know we're running out of time. Yeah, I, I watched that uh, special on the, what was the Colbert Report that was talking mm -hmm. about the, the copyright trolls for software and all that crazy stuff. Yeah, and and it's um, of course, it, and it, it's it, it could be a nasty piece of business. Although few of them make that much money, um, but yeah, uh, and again, if you've been on the wrong end of an SIIA or BSA audit, it's it's. You know how those things work, by the way. How do they get the right to come in and actually audit? Like well, that, number one, what do you give them? You gave them the right when you signed up the license. Most of the licenses have an audit right. But how do they prove you're even using it yeah. to begin with? Like, I don't have any windows in my office. You know what they do? My client. They bribe. They bribe disgruntled employees. Uh -huh. Go to their website. They actually offer money. They offer bounties. They actually call them bounties. I mean, yeah, yeah. It points for honesty. They offer bounties. And what happens almost every time? It's a it's a it's an employee that you fired, or is otherwise disgruntled. Who knows? And it's so easy to exceed. You buy you buy you know your your engineering firm, and you buy a ten seat license of CAD, and Autodesk is they're they're they're, they're tough customers, mm -hmm. and you 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 put it on twelve, right? And you you just lose track. You're a small business, and you never installed asset management software and you lose track and that's usually okay until 
you're, and then at that point you're screwed because you, now you can't you, taking the, the software off would become spoliation of evidence. Right. It would only make things worse. At that point, I, I, I personally, for me, I think you should call a lawyer who dealt with that sort of thing. Is there like a reasonable limit about their audit, or they just your license you can, you can you do whatever? I mean, do whatever often they want. our strategy is to tell them to jump in the lake, sue us. And to tell them we're not going to cooperate. And it really is the first question we have to ask do we even cooperate? And most people, the thing is, most people, their first reaction is just cooperate. And then what happens, I, I usually get called when they get the, when they get the settlement offer. What they do is they take, they, they take every item, of, every, every illicit copy, they pretend like you're going to go down to the software store and buy it off the shelf for, for, for full retail, no volume discounts. And then they multiply that by three. And then they make you t remove the illicit copy. So that if you want those again, it ends up becoming a multiplier of four, right? Because you got to repurchase all the software that, and and that there's no there's no legal basis for all that. That's just right. that's just their own little world. But nobody knows that until they talk to a lawyer. Anyway, I I, anyway, I really appreciate you guys coming 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 by. I love talking about this stuff. Um, again, Rick Sanders, Aaron and Sanders, um, are just. Uh, we're just up in Nashville. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be around to answer them.